Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a wonderful show for you this evening. Brian Schiff is here and is going to tell us a, a really a just amazing story of his flying professionally on 9-11 and also a lot of education as we uh, have time and get into a discussion about airline emergencies. He has a lot to offer. Uh, I, I'm absolutely in awe of Brian and cannot wait to have him join us. Before we get started, just a few things. Uh, uh, we have so much going on. If you go to socialflight.com or the free Social Flight mobile apps for Apple and Android devices, we are right in the middle of our Fly to Win Challenge. We are giving away a Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset. All you need to do is get the free app, go in, check in at your local airport, and if you go flying and check in from a bunch of other airports, you're going to get points. And if you get on that leaderboard, you get even more chances to win in our Fly to Win Challenge. In addition to that, we also have Social Flight's FAA learning system where you can get wings credits for videos and courses that are out there as well as aviation maintenance technician courses as well as IA renewal courses for those folks that are AMPs with an IA rating um, you are able to go and get your continuing education to qualify for your IA renewal and those continuing education credits are there FAA authorized along with wings and AMT programs and you get to see Brian with one of his shows. He actually has a program out there on Social Flight right now in the FAA learning system. It's an engine failure after takeoff course. It's absolutely fascinating. I consider it to be required viewing for just about anyone for safety. It's about single engine land takeoff um, and returning to the airport or not. Incredibly uh, important information and you will get wings credit for actually going out there and watching that course. In addition to that, Social Flight, of course, is there to inspire you to get out and fly. So we have aviation events, both in person and online. And another shout out to Brian, he has a four flight workshops course coming up on May 1st. It's gonna be the first Monday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And all of those are available to see in Social Flight. Just go to socialflight.com. So let's get started. First of all, tonight's program is brought to us by Tempest Arrow. Tempest Arrow is a strong supporter of Social Flight. Absolutely wonderful company. Uh, we have a video out on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, uh, where we uh, interviewed and spent some time with them down at Sun and Fun. And I am uh, really impressed because you know, we have suffered through so much in terms of supply chain issues and impacts to general aviation. And Tempest was a just an island in this stormy sea that had a uh, product all the way through. We had oil filters and spark plugs and so many things available. They really uh, kept, uh, I think, general aviation going through that. And so we really want to recognize that. In addition, they have air filters, which is brand new for them. And they've just started delivering fuel pumps certified as well. And what's important about that is these are the facet fuel pumps that are found on like uh, Pipers and Grumman's and things like that, that went out of production. No one's been able to get these and Tempest picked up the ball and created their own just to keep general aviation going. So I really wanna recognize that and thank Tempest for their support of general aviation and also of social flight. Now, Captain Brian Schiff is an airline pilot, a flight instructor, and one of the most innovative educators in general aviation. He flies for a major airline and is type rated on the Airbus 320, the Boeing 727, 757, 767, the DC-9, CL-65, Learjet, and G-5. And in spite of all those big iron type ratings, you're just as likely to see Brian flying in the pattern in his Cetabria as you are to see him on the flight deck. As you might imagine from his last name, he's the son of Barry Schiff, and although the apple didn't fall far from the tree, Brian has carved out a unique reputation for his ability to teach complex procedures and concepts in a way that even a pilot like me can understand. I'm absolutely thrilled to call him a close friend, and I'm going to bring him on the line now. Please welcome to Social Flight Live, Captain Brian Schiff. Trying to check in and get my credit here on the Social Flight app. Hang on. <laughs> hey, Jeff, how are you? Perfect. So you checked in. Great. I You're did. just trying to game the system and, and win that headset, huh? Yeah, I'm in an aviation office here, and there's an event here going on at Social Flight, and I definitely want that headset. 
Mine's getting all those, you know, ratty knobs around the ears and everything like that. I need to get a new one. <laughs> oh man. Well, I, I hope things are, are well with you. And, um, I, I want to, you know, since we have limited time, I kind of want to get, get started with things on your story because this isn't something that a lot of people have heard. And, um, we've had, uh, just an, an, an interesting kind of series of guests over a period of time recently um, where we had Heather Penny, for example, on who um, f flew her F-16 with the National Guard to try to intercept Flight 93 on a suicide mission, unarmed, to bring it down. And it really brought to mind that you had a very personal story of flying on 9-11 and being airborne and can give people a perspective on that, that I wanted to share with the social flight audience. I think it, it's, it's truly, truly unique. Well, I appreciate you bringing me on and giving me the opportunity to do that. When I heard her story a couple of weeks ago when she was on your show, it, it really, uh, it moved me and brought me back to that day. It's obviously a day all of us remember where we were that day, uh, you know, if you're old enough to. And, and thinking about her and what she had to do possibly with United 93, which you'll hear in my story, I had a, a close call with as well. So that, that just really brought it home and, and made me rethink my story and brought it back to the current time. And, and I'm glad to tell it. So thank you for having me on. And the first time you asked me on your show, it was a compliment, but to be asked back after I've shown you my true colors is a true honor. So thank you so much. I appreciate it's it. It's so well deserved. Um, so I want to uh, start with uh, kind of the beginning of the day. There's something that everyone talks about. Heather talked yeah. about it. Uh, others have talked about it. And it's all about the type of day it was and the morning of 9-11. Can you talk about that? Yeah. And I think everybody out there were listening to this knows the first thing that everybody says is, wow, it was a beautiful, clear, crisp fall day the a perfect VFR day, the best day to go flying. And, you know, that kind of brings back a little bit of uh, PTSD for me. Whenever I hear someone say those words now, I get a little bit afraid where I'd almost rather it be an IFR day because when I hear those words again, it remembers, it reminds me of that day uh, because that's how it started out. You think there's nothing could possibly go wrong on this beautiful day. Yeah. So tell us your story of, of, what had you airborne that day and and what uh, what happened? So I was flying, I was captain on an uh, MD-80 uh, going to LaGuardia from St. Louis. And we were flying what was, uh, it was just after the merger uh, of American and TWA. And of course, I was at TWA, so our call sign was TWA 468. I'll never forget that either. Uh, and we were flying the first leg of a three-day trip with a new co-pilot who was new enough at the airline. He was on probation. Um, and we were going from St. Louis to LaGuardia to start our trip. And then afterwards, we were to go on to cities after that for three days. Well, it was a beautiful day. I decided to let him fly because uh, LaGuardia is a challenging airport to fly into. Anybody who's flown into there knows uh, it's a different kind of approach. We get to fly a visual approach into there. And it was a because it was a beautiful day, I thought this is a good opportunity to mentor my co-pilot and let him do it. So we were on our way on his leg, flying along, smooth, beautiful day. You could almost see New York right after takeoff from St. Louis. That's how clear it was. And about halfway there, we get a call from air traffic control that says, hey, uh, TWA 468, have you heard from your company yet? Uh, and curiously, we're like, no, uh, we've not heard anything. Why? What's up? And they said, well, New York is closed and uh, nobody's getting in. Uh, we're, we need to know where you're going to divert. And so at that point, it, it really took us by surprise because you normally would expect this to happen when the weather is bad, but the weather was good the whole way there. And it was a clear sky, calm winds, clear and visibility unrestricted. So we thought nobody's getting into New York. What, you know, you think, okay, it was an aircraft disabled on the runway. It can't be that because, uh, you know, they have many runways there. We could choose another one. So we just, we were befuddled as to why we were being diverted. So while I was trying to get a hold of the company, uh, my first officer was flying and we get this printer message that you're showing on the screen there. And as that printer message came up, the company wanted us to just return to St. Louis because air traffic control was shutting off New York. Hmm. So let's, so let's while read that, that for a second, because I find that, I find the message kind of interesting. 
Yeah. They, they first told you as an airliner that it was, they thought it was IFR being the issue. Well, IFR in that sense means this is a re-release. So we're dispatched oh, okay. to St. Louis and IFR, the coding on that means we don't have an alternate. So oh. if we had an alternate, you would see the alternate name there, return to St. Louis and Indianapolis alternate. But because the weather's good, they just say IFR, meaning no alternate. Oh, interesting. I didn't understand that. Got it. Yeah. We always yeah. fly on, you know, instrument flight rules, but that just meant no alternate. Uh, this is due to ATC being closed. And then the dispatcher signed it. And while that was printing, and I, I underline the timestamp there, because that was about the time United 93 was flying erratically. Uh, ATC came over the radio and said to us, turn right immediately, turn as fast as you can to avoid an airliner we're not talking to. And they're flying erratically, climbing and descending and turning, and we don't know what they're doing. And Let me bring, while uh, I, was I think we might have that, uh, an, a, a, an image that you sent of what was happening with that. Let's share that for a second as well. Okay. Yeah, and so that's about where we were. We're approaching, uh, is it Dryer VOR? Uh, just west of Cleveland. And they were just east of Cleveland and flying the maneuvers that they were doing and all over the place. And that was when the passengers were fighting to take control of that airplane, knowing what was going to happen. They somehow learned what was going to happen. The You can go online and find the ATC audio from that day where the, the hijackers thought they were making a PA address to the passengers, but they were, in fact, talking to air traffic control. They were making their PA about what their intentions were. Uh, but the passengers learned what was going to happen, and as we know where the famous line, let's roll, comes from, uh, when they decided after uh, – getting off the phone with his wife, the hero on that day, I can't remember his name, Todd. Uh, anyway, they took down that aircraft. They, you know, the, the, cat, the pilots were taken out. They were murdered. The hijackers had control of the airplane and the passengers took over and intentionally crashed that day to save what they knew to, was about to happen with that airliner, that it was going to be used like the others as a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, and, and that was just, I think back to this day, my friend, my fellow pilots talk about, you know, could we have done that? If I knew I'm a pastor and I know what's going to happen, do I have it in me to do what they did? And I'm going to be honest with you, Jeff, I just don't, I don't know. I don't know if mm -hmm. I could have done that, but uh, true heroes on that air, airplane for what they did. Yeah. So you actually were straight, straight in with that aircraft and, and, and actually had to confront uh, what was happening with traffic with, with Flight 93. And this is another image uh, from that. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so this just depicts that we had made uh, a right turn. ATC made it an evasive turn. They said as steep as you can and turn as fast as you can to a heading of south. And that was the time that that printer message you showed came up. It was printing while we were in that turn. I still remember hearing the printer going, during that turn, I had just taken the airplane and cranked it over into a steep turn because I, I knew the FO didn't get that and wasn't as assertive as I was. And that's when the message came up. And I correlated that with the radar replays later that they had of United 93 and realized that that was, in fact, uh, a, a vector to avoid United 93. And it was then that we got that message from the company and requested a clearance to return to St. Louis. And then, of course, it all continued to spiral downhill from there. Um, hmm. So after that, uh, we got a clearance direct back to Indianapolis and fly the arrival into St. Louis. But with each passing minute, you could hear the intensity in air traffic control's voice getting more intense. You know, it was changing. They were, they were getting more and more uh, stressed, you could tell. And it was just getting more serious until one time they just made an announcement that there would be uh, a closure of the U.S. airspace and we're going to issue clearances to all aircraft airborne and don't acknowledge the clearance, just follow it. Just don't, don't read it back. When you, and they just started reading out clearances. Boom, boom, boom to everybody to different airports. We got ours to back to St. Louis. Hmm. I was uh, a bit remiss when I had offered, hey, well, you just want us to go to Indianapolis. Well, hindsight would tell me no because you're not going to fly home <laughs> nobody flew for days after that and I, I you know afterwards could have kicked myself but luckily they said no you're in a good tight line for st louis continue on 
and we were actually the end of that line. Uh, we were one of the last aircraft to land, but we did hear while they were giving out clearances and there was a break in that, the Delta, uh, a Delta flight had requested, he was cleared to an Air Force base. And I, re I remember hearing him request to go to Atlanta. He said, if it's all the same, we'd rather just go to Atlanta. And the, the haunting words that came next from air traffic control will never leave my brain. And I remember hearing this and they said, Delta, we have a national emergency right now. Any noncompliance with an ATC instruction will be viewed as a threat against the United States. And we have fighters scrambled. When we heard that, basically what we heard is the air traffic control telling Delta, do what you're told or we're going to shoot you down. Hmm. And my co-pilot and I were now scanning the skies for mushroom clouds. We were flying. We were shaking. We were like, what is going on? I mean, literally, we were like stressed out. I had to calm him down. I'm like, look, let's just focus on flying this airplane. That's our only job. We've got good weather. Let's focus on flying this airplane. And what do you tell your passengers? Right. That was a tough one. Um, now, when you're flying an airline, you, for an airline, uh, you have air traffic control you're communicating with. You also have your dispatch. Um, tell me about what was happening back at headquarters uh, and, and what information kind of you were getting there. I know that there's one image, for example, that you got that has to do with, with you know, reaching dispatch. Yeah, with everybody diverting, all the pilots of all the aircraft, all the flights were trying to reach dispatch. Well, each dispatcher has a number of flights. And at that time, I think it may have been somewhere between 15 and 20. I don't know the number, but they're not handling one flight. They have many flights. Well, with everybody calling in at once, it was impossible to get a hold of them. And that's why they were sending these, these printer messages. So he sent me uh, this message saying, I, I think you can get us on 129.1. Try that because of where our location and it was, wasn't as congested. And he wanted to tell me what was going on, uh, but I couldn't. I never did get a hold of dispatcher. They were uh, talking about logistics. I mean, putting this puzzle together about where airplanes are going to land. Never before has every airliner in our country been on the ground. There's not room for all these aircraft. So it's a logistical nightmare about where everybody's going to park. How are we going to get the people off of the airplane? Uh, in fact, we waited four hours for a gate because we had to take turns w with the gates. There just weren't enough gates to have all the aircraft down on the ground at one time, let alone fueling and support and everything that goes along with that. It's just never happened. It's unprecedented. So getting a hold of dispatch was tough. I never did get a hold of them. And then I, I believe they sent me another message at one point. Uh, telling us what happened to, to very briefly. And yeah, so there it is that uh, security was at the top of the list. Now, I had already gone back to the back of the cabin to talk to passengers. Remember back in those days, the pilots went back, we went for a stroll in the cabin and we'd schmooze with passengers. I loved doing that. It's one of my favorite parts of the job because uh, I like the people aspect of it. When I walk up to the airplane airport, and I see a family members hugging each other goodbye, it reminds me that I'm taking their most prized possessions and my responsibility, and they're handing them off to me. And it makes me realize, okay, this is important stuff. This is something to take serious. And, and, and I, that's why I like to fly people. That's why I didn't go to work for FedEx or UPS. But so I was back in the cabin, I talked to my flight attendants, and I told them what I knew limited at the time. Uh, but I said, look, we can't... Uh, don't don't raise any issues uh, and and I was trying to calm them down too because what I got from air traffic control next was a call that said hey uh, TW 468 you know they said trip 468 are you okay and for those of us who learned to fly before 911 and you you're so young I'm sure you didn't you didn't <laughs> learn to fly before 911 did you <laughs> well the word trip was a key word right if they called trip was like swalking 7500 so if you, you did, said instead of flight 468, you say trip 468, that meant I'm under duress, I'm being hijacked. Well, when they asked us trip 468, are you okay? I didn't answer right away. And then I started, I looked at my co-pilot, he looked at me, we're like, how do we answer that? Are we okay? And he's asking basically, is there a hijacker in the back of your airplane? And so I called the flight attendants on the inner phone 
and I asked them, I said, is everything okay back in the cabin? They said, yeah. I said, is everything normal? Are the passengers behaving? I, I didn't know how to get this information out of them without making them panic, without starting something. Mm. And it turns out everything was fine. Uh, they were okay. We were okay. We didn't have any hijackers so far as we knew on that airplane. Uh, but that was really a, a strange deal to do that. And, and, and when I look back at hindsight that I had went back and walked through the cabin, I think, wow, that that's, I mean, we wouldn't do that now. We don't, we don't expose the, right. the flight deck door is bulletproof. It's, we have protocols for going in and out of the cabin and we don't just go stroll back and forth. Uh, if at all possible, we're to keep that airplane out of the hands of somebody else. Our entire hijacking protocol has changed. It, it used to be that we would acquiesce, we'd give them what they want. They just wanted to go to Cuba or defect somewhere, whatever. Uh, but now that we have them using airliners as weapons of mass destruction, we, we cannot let it get into their hands, and that's the utmost priority. Yeah. Yeah, that really is the biggest, uh, the biggest change, right? I mean, it, we, the security is in place because the, the awareness of what's going to happen is different. And yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what do you think about the concept that to some degree that it, the minute that that innocence was lost on 9-11, that, that was where everything changed? So some of it is locking the doors and procedures, but so much of it is, is an awakening to what could happen. Yeah, the innocence of the freedom. I remember our flight attendants would just walk in and out of the cockpit. And we would just go back and stroll with the passengers. It was the people aspect of it that I really liked. I enjoyed that. Um, now, taking that away, putting up a bulletproof door, I mean, really, what does that tell you? I, we're going to put a bulletproof door between you and your passengers when really our passengers are the best line of defense right now. And I hope anybody listening who's passenger on an airline remembers that, that keeping your eyes open, being aware of what's going on around you, uh, but not being overly paranoid and not profiling. So there's a fine line there. But yeah, our innocence was taken. It was such a romantic experience to go fly somewhere on an airliner, and, and it was relatively easy. But over the years, you know, the the the, sh the shooting of the pilots on that FedEx airplane, and or was a PSA, I don't remember, but what instituted everybody having to go through security and the portals, and we keep adding and adding and adding to that. Everything that the hijackers brought on board on 9-11 was legal to bring on board that day. Yeah, you know, they brought box cutters. There's nothing wrong with that. A pocket knife, you can bring that. Well, that changed. Then someone attempted to hijack an airplane after that, and it was found that they had a liquid explosive. So now our liquids are down to three ounces of liquids and, you know, yeah, yeah, all these <laughs> rules. <laughs> three ounces and taking your shoes off and things like that. It just um, keeps getting worse. Yeah, yeah. Hardest yeah, part. And, 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 and the reality, as you mentioned, I think a lot of people believe that uh, – that it all actually changed that day with everyone's awareness, as you mentioned, that the past, yeah. you know, what are the chances that people are going to believe that if they comply, that everything's going to be okay. And, and that's really the biggest change. It's to some degree, it's, it's too bad because I think it's, uh, you know, I miss those days of having an open cockpit door and we have so many pilots in our audience right now, obviously. And, and yeah. it was wonderful to be a private pilot and, walk out front and 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 bond a little bit with the with the crew and have them show you a few things about what was going on like those are memories that i have and so many other people have that um i think it's too bad our children won't yeah and i'd like to encourage people not to be afraid to do that during the boarding process or especially during the deplaning process uh, it's sad if a flight crew leaves before they get to your row to exit the airplane and you get off and there's nobody up there uh, <laughs> That's not cool. I, I, like I said, I, I do it for the people. I like it. I stay on board the aircraft. I say goodbye to every passenger. If they're kids, I let them come up in the cockpit. We take pictures of them sitting in the seat. And, you know, I enjoy that. We can still do that on the ground at the gate. When the cockpit door is open, you're welcome to come visit. And if you're a pilot, and most people watching this show, I would presume are, be sure to come let us know. Hey, if you need me, I'm a private pilot. I'm back here. I can fly your airplane if you, you I'm kidding. <laughs> but you love that, right? You we, absolutely love it when people do that. I don't mind it. I like to know if there's a pilot back there. Because if I do have an emergency, hey, there's someone who can come up here and do the radios if I need to, if I need that. Are you uh, serious? Oh, yeah. You want to know we if had, there's a private pilot on board? If there's an emergency situation, I would not hesitate to use that. If, if uh, my co-pilot was... Uh, 
you know, medically disabled or if I was and he needed help, yeah, sure, absolutely. We would use all our resources at hand, absolutely. Brian, you just made the night or the year of every pilot listening right now and watching who has this idea now that I'm, I'm going to let them know I'm here. Put me in I'm the game. The and they're exactly and guys eat the fish, like do whatever you got to do. Like we're, yeah. we're, we're ready. I'd love to work the radios. <laughs> yeah. Let us know if you can fly an airplane and did not eat the fish that night, then let us know. Yeah. I mean, and look at all the dreams that we're creating for the people who the pilots who want to sit back there and have dreams of, I'm, you know, bringing it in for landing because the pilots were both incapacitated or something. It could happen. I think it has happened. <laughs> But, so, but yeah. so is it true though? You talk about the cockpit door being open. It's not always open. Is it true that uh, when you get, uh, let's say, uh, a, a, a two landings or three landings for the price of one, maybe the cockpit door sometimes stays shut? <laughs> well, the first officers would like that. If it was their landing, I'll open it and and <laughs> you know, just point. thank your first officer for the landing, where we've lowered the elevation of Cincinnati by eight feet. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some people, do, if it's a bad landing. I've seen that happen. Yep, we can just keep that. I, I, I may or may not have heard from uh, from from a friend of mine that 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 may be a thing. <laughs> it may be, yeah. I mean, when it's a greaser, there's first guy to stand there at the cockpit door, taking credit and accolades and saying goodbye to their pastors, just waiting for the nice landing compliments to start rolling in. But yeah, if we prank it on, there's no point. And we also got something here like, will it, okay, so if, so if that miracle uh, happens, which is bad for everybody except for the one called up from, you know, row 23A uh, yeah. or C23A, do, do you sign their logbook? Do they get that? Oh, I would absolutely sign their logbook. If I gave any flight instruction, I would certainly sign the logbook. Absolutely. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. find out where Brian's flying, be on there because you know he's going to be open to, uh, to doing that and... Uh, you know, you, you, you're going to end up having all your, your first officers get their shins kicked while people are like walking on board and trip <laughs> and, and, and the jetway. I mean, this isn't right. going to work out well. Right. Or not going to be able to, you know, have the flight attendants keep a good eye on the coffee that they're bringing up or the food. What, don't anybody get near that. No. Wow. But all that aside, so, I will say that after, on 9-11, after landing was almost the worst part after we landed. Um, now, you remember, I was going to New York. So I had a plane load of people who knew people in New York. Well, they didn't know what was happening. And we were on final approach. I actually at one point had to tell my first officer, just focus on landing. And we were, like I said before, in a tight line of aircraft landing in St. Louis. And when we were on final, we could see it looked like Oshkosh. And when we were on final, I was waiting for them to tell me what color dot I'm supposed to land on because there was an aircraft that there's no way they were going to clear the runway before we landed. And ATC came on and said, hey, you're clear to land. Don't go around. You're going to land with other aircraft on the runway ahead of you. And we know it. We need the runway. And I could see why they needed the runway because there were a bunch of fighters taxing out. And uh, so they didn't want me going around. And we landed right in almost in formation with another airline. I don't want to say formation, but we were probably a couple thousand feet behind them. And uh, then had nowhere to go on the airport. I wide bodies, narrow bodies, international, domestic flights everywhere, all over this airport, and we found out that we had, you know, a four-hour wait to to uh, to get to the gate. And where did we wait? Right next to the National Guard ramp, where we watched them load up missiles on airliners. And this is when we learned what happened was pretty much on final approach. And I told my first officer, "We're going to tell everybody as soon as we land. I'll make a PA announcement, tell them everything we know." But in the air, I had to make an announcement. And in the air, I just said, there's nothing wrong with our airplane, our airline. The weather in New York is fine. Um, for some reason, air traffic control has shut off all traffic to New York, and we just don't know what it is. So we're going back to St. Louis. Uh, it, it, I never had to make a PA like that. Then after landing, uh, I got a PA that uh, another message from dispatch that said something to the effect of the Pentagon being on fire, multiple hijackings, and... and uh, uh, the World Trade Center had been hit, and we just about shuddered. And that's where I told my first officer, you need to just focus on this landing. And we're going to all fess up and tell everybody, because they're going to get on their cell phones right after we land and learn everything. Anyway, so as soon as we turned off the runway, I made a PA. I said, we're going to go find a place to park, and we're going to tune on uh, 1120 AM in St. Louis, KMOX, and we're going to hold the microphone up to the PA speaker to the, with the AM radio playing, and we can all listen to this. 
And that's what we did. And from then on, we were just general public in America, being Americans, listening to what was happening. Um, and I, I knew that, you know, my wife was probably panicking because I always give her a copy of my pairing, which is a, a printout of my trip. And it says where I'm going. Normally, she doesn't care where I'm going. She's just glad that I'm going. And <laughs> to this day, she was glad I printed it up because she looked at it and she said, LGA. And she didn't know where that was. So she called a friend of mine because she was watching the news. She knew what was happening. And she said, Brian's going to LGA. Where is that? And he, he told her, it's New York. That's New York where Brian's going. Well, she lost it then. I was unable to call her. You know, I had my old flip phone at the time and I'm trying to call. I, I could get voicemails, but I couldn't call out. And the voicemails, first one from her was like, oh, you're not going to believe this. Some airplane crashed into a building in New York. The second one, and they, they progressively got more emotional. The second one says, oh, my gosh, that was an airliner that hit. And, and while she was on the phone with me, she said something about seeing on the news another one hitting. And then she called me back in tears after she learned that I was, in fact, flying to New York and wanting me to call her back as soon as I could and blah, blah, blah. She, she just she was a wreck. I tried calling. I couldn't. I just couldn't get through uh, locally there. We had a lot of passengers who were bound for New York. So obviously they knew people. So after landing, I went back through the cabin and I'm talking to passengers. Uh, I spoke to a gentleman who was going for his um, uh, rehearsal dinner that night. Uh, and he was to get married that next weekend to his fiance who worked on one of the top floors of the North Tower. To this day, I don't know the end of that story, but I, I have a feeling it's not good. Uh, it just disturbs me. But so many stories of all the people on my airplane. And then eventually one gentleman, a Korean gentleman, came up to us and, and he's looking around and saying, Korean, Korean, speak Korean. And so I, I, I could tell he didn't understand what was going on. I mean, could you imagine you don't speak English? You're back where you started. You don't know why. And you see this going on. Uh, the man was a wreck. And so I said, I made a PA announcement to our passengers. Does anybody speak Korean? And nobody on board did, but we had a, a, a gentleman in first class, a businessman whose colleague, in a secretary, spoke Korean, and he was on the phone with her. And so he came up to me and he said, my secretary speaks Korean and she's on the phone. He, she's happy to talk to him. And he handed this gentleman the phone and he's listening. As, as he's listening, I could see the color leaving his face, and he buckles to his knees and hands the phone back, and he's fishing out a business card from his wallet with a 202 area code for a Manhattan dry cleaner. And he's pointing to the phone number, wanting us to call. And I thought, wow, there's no way we're going to get a hold of uh, the people he wanted us to call. But someone don't, you know, volunteered their phone and, and he kept trying to call. And he eventually did get through. I couldn't get a hold of my wife in St. Louis, but he got through to somebody in Manhattan. And you could read by the body language that everything was okay. And thank wow. God. Uh, but boy, the stories, I could go on and on about talking to the passengers on that airplane about what was going on, why they were going to New York, who they were going to meet, their company people, everybody had something going on in the North Tower. And it was just a, a very, very emotional day. What has, has changed uh, aside from, you know, the, the bulletproof doors and the procedures for, for the cockpit there and the things that we see as passengers boarding what have what has changed what types of things come to mind from your perspective from that of being a pilot and the procedures that you do and maybe maybe the training yeah i mean a lot of that the procedures that i can't talk about <laughs> but mm. like you said our, our innocence the fact that we have to think and be suspect of our own passengers like that and that everybody is you know treated as though they're guilty already, you know, going through security. And, and, and I think the emotional aspect of that and, and the, the door and separating us and the things that we've spoken about, I think are the biggest change. Uh, the, the, as far as the working goes, it's really taken a job that I absolutely loved. I don't want to say it turned it into a job because I still enjoy it, but it really has taken a big bite out of the enjoyment part of flying an airliner from A to B because of all the protocols that we have to go through, 
the fact that I have to call a flight attendant to get permission to go to the bathroom and then come babysit the other pilot while I go to the bathroom, you know what I mean? And, and these protocols and all these things that are at the fore, it just keeps it at the forefront with all the procedures and policies that we do, with the security that we see, with the PA announcements we hear through the airport, with the, the, the color codes they had for so long, the TSA status is orange, or the, mm. the, the threats and things that happen. And we see a lot more than the general public does because they are still trying to test us. There are mm. people and entities out there trying to test us, and we have to be very diligent. Uh, we're catching more than you would probably want to know. And every year when I go to recurrent training, they show us these things and it's, it's secure information. I can't talk about it, yeah. but it's happening still. And so we just need to be, we can't get complacent. And the biggest change is that we have become complacent and the world is such that we shouldn't be. Hmm. There, there are some areas like, for example, in Washington, D.C., in the freeze zone that um, have changed for general aviation as well. Yeah. Do those things, uh, are those changes that affect you as, as an airline pilot or are your procedures for something like DC uh, the same being a, an airline flight? Since, of course, it's very different as a, um, as a GA pilot. Yeah, because we're always IFR and we're part 121 scheduled, it, it really hasn't changed. It did for a while. For example, we had to have all of our passengers seated an hour before landing, before entering the uh, special flight rules, uh, TFR. Yeah, the SFRA. Yeah. So we had, and, and so there were rules that for a while were very restrictive and they've relaxed that. We don't have to do that as much. So effectively from our perspective, it's really not much different other than what we, we might have. It's probably a greater preponderance of uh having a, a federal air marshal on board, you know, when mm. we go to that city. Other than that, the flying aspect of it is pretty much the same because we're, we're IFR. We need to be so, vigilant, though. So just for, for everyone on board so they understand, if you are a GA pilot and you plan on flying into the, the DC, the Washington, D.C. area, you have a larger area, the, the special flight rules uh, zone, the SFRA, um, where you need special training in order to go in, but that's about it. But then there's a tighter area on the inside, the, the FRZ, the freeze zone, where you can only get in if you have special authorization and training and clearances and background check from the uh, Secret Service. Um, and that's that's what we're referring to here. And that is a whole different, <laughs> different level. <laughs> yeah, and I'll be honest, I haven't flown into there as or around there as in GA. I've not flown there in general aviation only with the airline. I'm familiar with it. <laughs> yeah. Are you, did you get the training? Have I you did. Been checked I out did. For all I that? can tell anyone who's interested in flying into the DC three, I think it's going down, unfortunately to the DC two soon um, uh, of only two airports that are going to be remaining um, in, in their GA airports that you can go into. But Honestly, I encourage people, if you're anywhere near the area and able to do it, it is a painful process um, to get through, but it will let you land at College Park and take the metro straight downtown into D.C. And my belief is that if we don't exercise our rights in order to do this in a safe manner by going through the process, then the process goes away and we lose the ability to have access to things like that. And that, in addition to the ability of doing it personally. That's one of the reasons that I actually went through that. But, but it's a, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a challenge to get through all of that. And, uh, and there's some chuckles along the way, because they do give you a, uh, uh, you, you wind up when you finish the whole process with a special code um, that you use on your flight plans and special procedures to come in. But in the very beginning, when they first made that possible, you were supposed to announce that special super secret code on the radio. <laughs> Oh, geez. Yeah. I don't think so, it was the best policy. I think they've changed it since then. <laughs> yeah. The frequency anybody with a handheld could listen to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Here's my tail number and my special super secret handshake and code. And then everyone writes it down. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it's yeah, not I like that. Done uh, that. Yeah. And I know there's a course online you can take, right? I mean, the FAA website That's has. That's for the SFRA, for the larger area that allows but you to fly for the through the airspace. But not for the, what is now actually Hyde Field is unfortunately closed because of this, mm. but it's now down to only two airports. Um, and that, that's, that's unfortunately kind of the penalty that we're paying. 
for for this type of thing is losing airports that you know airports that are close to cities are um as we learned with migs field in in yeah. chicago as we've learned with other areas are yeah. um are difficult and, and and that's another reason i would encourage people to exercise their right and go to college park go go to these airports so that they can um keep them open that's the only way that they can sell fuel it's the only way that they can stay in business is by having our patronage um so if you're on the east coast that's my pleading to you to go through the process uh feel free to reach out to me at social flight i'm, I'm happy to help you a little bit um along the way it is it is like i said it's not there's no cost to it that i'm aware of but it's painful in terms of getting um through secret service interviews and there's all these different steps and so it just Basically, a lot of people throw up their hands at all the steps you have to go through, but it, it really is worth it, I think, for the benefit of general aviation. Yeah, and that's a shame. And on the West Coast, they're just pricing everybody out of airports, mm, unfortunately. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about airline emergencies. We talked about this uh, in terms of what we we're going to cover today. And of course, 9-11 being the biggest one. Uh, but when we move on, you've had a fair amount of experience with managing emergencies from the cockpit of an airliner. And I think there's lessons there, not just for those of us who actually are in the back of the airliner, and it's important to know what happens in the front, but also as to how we can translate that to general aviation. Let's sure. start with yeah. some things uh, that, that you've personally dealt with, uh, like uh, you know, smoke or fumes in the cockpit. Yeah, the I would say the worst emergency that I had in flight, like a problem with my airplane, obviously 9-11, we didn't have an emergency on our flight, arguably uh, an emergent day, but the worst emergency that I'd ever had was a fumes event. I've had smoke before, and, and smoke you, is You bad. say that like it's casual. <laughs> uh, no big deal. Well, the first time I had smoke, I was a flight engineer, and they taught us, you know, hey, when you turn an air conditioning pack on, make sure that you watch for a spike in the amps. You want to see a draw that because you have to tell you that the pack cooling fan came on that blows cool air across a heat exchanger, blah, 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 blah. 727 days, we practically had to build the airplane. Anyway, if you don't get that spike, turn the pack off or you're going to smoke it, meaning it's going to just get so hot it's going to burn oil and you're going to smoke the cabin. And I've done that. And at the time I thought, okay, bad, but it was a good experience because I learned what burning oil smells like. <laughs> and I learned that if you make it go away, it'll stop. <laughs> if you take away the source. So when I had the smoke events, it was smoke in the cabin. And I will say it was so bad I couldn't see the instruments. I, it was nighttime. It was so thick, and I, I remember the light, the overhead map light coming down and making a spear through the smoke. And, and you have to get your oxygen mask, smoke goggles on, so that you're not breathing it, and you can see, and don't burn your eyes, blah, 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 blah. It's hard to, difficult to fly like that. Um, that one I learned was, okay, this is oil and air conditioning. If I turn my packs off, boom, the smoke goes away. I go back and land. Those, although serious, could have been a lot worse didn't frighten me as much as the fumes event that I had. And one of the things that I learned during that event is well, there are things that you don't learn in training. Uh, you don't realize that when you're stressed, and, and, and maybe you've, some of you out there have experienced this, that when you're stressed, you get a really dry mouth. Your mouth dries out. I don't know the, the, the physics behind that, but your mouth gets super dry when you're stressed. Well, add to that 100% oxygen by wearing the oxygen mask, and you're gonna really dry. I couldn't talk. I, I tried to talk on the radio, tried to talk on the PA. I could not speak because my throat was so dry. Mm. And I remember thinking to myself, imagining myself biting into a lemon, just trying to get a, a drop of fluid. And I didn't have any water nearby, plus I couldn't take my mask off. Uh, and it worked, just thinking about myself biting into a lemon. So I always carry quench gum, you know, what the runners use when, when they're, uh, uh, exercising and running. So something like that is huge. And also the tunnel vision that you get in an emergency. You don't learn it. You don't, you don't get that in training. Uh, you don't get the panicking flight attendants and passengers. I had a flight attendant lose it on this time when I had the, the fumes and she was panicking and calling and wouldn't leave us alone. And the passengers were having a hard time too, because there's nothing I can do to help them except get that airplane on the ground. 
their eyes were burning, throats were burning. It was a very noxious fume event. And so the flight attendant calls me and says, there's a really a strong burning odor in the cabin and it's getting hot. Um, well, when it's, as soon as that starts, I, I immediately start thinking, okay, we're get, we got to get this thing on the ground. I don't know what the, the problem is. But more and more things were being fed to me that were making it seem more dire. Like she said, when I walk past row 20 to 25, the floor gets soft. And, it's, and I took my shoes off and walked, and the floor was hot. I'm thinking cargo fire. I don't know what's going on. Something, but this is not good. Well, we can have that procedure done in the simulator. I can learn how to handle that. But here I am in the real world. It's, I had sat everybody down early, and, and the flight attendants included, because of turbulence. We were being uh, deviating around thunderstorms. Uh, in the area, and we were picking our way through a line at that time. The kind of deviating where my first officer was head down, buried in the radar, telling me to hold this heading, all right, come left a little bit, and he's literally trying to get me through this weather, and I'm just flying, you know, through these little clear canyons of this weather when this happened. That they don't teach you in, the, in, in training, so it's a combination of things, and in, in the preamble to, to our emergency checklist, and I'll just read it here, it says, in an emergency situation requiring immediate decision and action, the captain may take any hyphenated or you know, italicized action necessary after carefully considering the circumstances. In such a case, the captain may deviate from prescribed operations, procedures, and methods, weather minimums, and FARs in the interest of safety. So you've, you do what you've got to do. You're not just going to do a checklist if it doesn't quite meet the situation. Well, in this situation, the checklist I knew when we go electric, because the flight attendant said it was fumes, but it's coming, it smells electric, and it's coming through the air vents. Well, we had a choice to make a, which checklist to do, the air conditioning fumes and smoke or the electric fumes and smoke. And then it says, if unknown, assume electric, because that's worse. And we did. We thought it was an electrical issue, and in fact, it was we later learned. So I knew that that procedure, I was a Czech airman at the time, and I taught this in the simulator. I knew what we were about to do. We we're about to shut everything off and leave it just the standby instruments. That's the first step of the emergency checklist for that procedure. Well, we were deviating in and around thunderstorms. I was about to lose my radar when the first officer starts shutting off the buses. And I knew that. So I said, hang on, hang on. And I told ATC, do what you can to help us. Um, uh, I'm trying to abbreviate the story because I know we're limited on time, but I took a mental picture of that radar to dead reckon my way. I said, present heading for about two minutes. I remember thinking this in my head, turn left for 45 degrees and just hold that heading and I'm going to come out the other side of this. Had that in my head and I said, all right, go. You do the checklist. You race to the end of the checklist. I'll race to the airport. We'll see who gets done first. I'm not going to wait for you to finish that to land because we're on fire told the flight attendants, plan on evacuating. We're gonna get there as soon as we can. I told ATC, help me through this weather. We're losing our radar and our electrics, and I may not be able to talk. I don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, and he said, as soon as you bust out, turn left, and, and it was Indianapolis, runway 23 was active with about a 10 knot wind, and I said, now I'm gonna land straight in runway five. I was southeast, and I said, I'll take the tailwind. It was a two mile long runway. Um, so I'm breaking rules. I'm at 330 knots, uh, as fast as I could go, getting the barber pole below 10,000 feet. I want to get this thing on the ground. And I told the first officer just to start hanging gear and flaps right at their maximum speeds as I start pulling power back. And uh, at one point on final, and, and all this time the flight attendants are asking for updates, you got to do something. Can you drop the oxygen masks? Uh, that would not have helped because our oxygen masks, as you know, they're diluter type and it, it mixes with ambient air. And, I don't know where the fire is. I don't want to start mixing pure oxygen with that anyway. So I couldn't do it. And I had nothing to do to help them except get it on the ground. I, I made a PA announcement when in between pooping my pants and panicking, I had to save calmly within my, in my airline captain PA voice, uh, ladies and gentlemen, no, <laughs> no, but I had to come on. And I said, hello folks, we, I know we have a problem. Everything's going to be okay. We'll be on the ground shortly. And I just said that about every two minutes. And, and I, I later learned that that was helpful, that I did that and just kind of reassured everybody and did my best to keep a calm voice. We landed, we have, well, I remember at one point on final, the flight attendant said, it's getting up better now. The smoke is going away, the fumes. And I pulled my oxygen mask off and uh, 
no, it wasn't going away. They were just becoming acclimated to it or something because it was still pretty bad. And I said, no, let's just still plan on evacuating when we land. And uh, we landed on the runway, came to a stop. I think I'm, he, he set the flaps, the full flaps as, as we were in the flare because that's about when I slowed down to the speed for full flaps. Brought it to a stop, evacuated. I think it was seven minutes, but felt like seven hours uh, from that first event happening to us getting through the clouds, turning direct, booging to the airport, landing, and then evacuating. And as it turns out, it was a, um, a pack fan, a, air, a gasper fan, I'm sorry, which is the, you know, the little eye vents that you can open and close above your seat. When we're not running our air conditioning, there's a fan that just blows air to recycle air through those vents that fan had shorted itself and grounded to itself and was burning itself. It was a charred hulk of blackness when we got on the ground. Uh, I didn't know that. I mean, it, it was it was like grounded to the on position or something, but that's what the fire department told me it later was. But we evacuated and everybody was okay other than scratchy throats and eyes afterwards. But wow. after I flew that, after we landed, after we all met at the hotel to debrief that whole event, I was scared. During the event, I did what I had to do. I, I did what I was trained to do. I got through it. And it, strangely, I wasn't scared at that time. I just did it. And then afterwards, I was afraid to get back on an airplane for a short period. Well, that, that's, that's the training coming out. When, when you train for emergencies in a simulator, do, do you don fire gear? Do you don your goggles and smoke hood and see what it's like to fly like that? They do it once. Like when you initially check out on an airplane, they, they have you put it on. So you go through the motion, put it on and goggles and everything. You can see what it looks like. But I'm going to be honest. I didn't fly a full approach like that. I didn't have to get through the weather like that. I didn't have to make a PA to the passengers and, and worry about a procedure that's a little bit different that didn't match any of our checklists. Uh, but so we do go through the motions of putting it on, switching the PA and the, the transmitter so that it's going to come through that microphone and not the handheld. Mm -hmm. we, we go through those motions and then they say, all right, take it off. And we're just going to run through the checklist in while the simulator is frozen. And you'll learn the, the, the checklist, the procedures, the why and what you're doing. Uh, and, and we kind of expand out, do an expanded version of running that checklist, but not in real time and not with all that equipment on. I mean, I think I did that once in my career. Hmm. And, 30, 34 years at the airlines. Taking some of this and, and translating it and applying it to general aviation and, and so many pilots again in the audience listening to this, are there, are there things do you think that, that we can do um, and in changing our own practice or our own training in uh, how to reach a fire extinguisher, how to talk to your passengers, how to know how to do these things, maybe even if you fly with family members all the time saying, look, I'm going to go through a checklist with you right now of what would happen in this circumstance. And, and I'm going to tell, we're going to practice what I'm going to say to you, what we're going to do, where to get things from that maybe aren't part of go up there, pull the power back and do a best glide and show me you can land, which is just the only thing it seems that people do unless they're in a retractable, maybe they go through the manual gear drop. But, those seem to be the only things that are practiced in general aviation. Right, and it seems almost right. We're gonna do steep turn stalls and some point I'm gonna pull the engine on you at, and you're gonna to have to do a manual gear extension and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's, it's very rote and familiar, uh, so you're right. And so to answer your question, yes, there are things as GA pilots we can do. Now, one thing that that has changed and I've taken the change to my general aviation flying is to always have a pair of ski goggles with me, some kind of goggles I can wear. If you can't see because you've got fumes in the cockpit or smoke, especially if you're in an aircraft where you can't open the windows. Uh, most GA airplanes, light aircraft, you can open the windows and that will help remove a lot of the fumes because everything gets sucked out of the window. Uh, but carry goggles, even and if you're in a hotel, that's another good idea. Have them there in your hotel with you because if there's a hotel fire, you can see to get out. You don't realize hmm. how much we need our eyes. You will be blinded when your eyes are burning. So that's one thing. Carry some emergency equipment. They make some hoods that are great. They make these any kind of goggles that you know will keep water out, will keep smoke out. But as far as being prepared, what we do at the airlines is regular training, and 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 so I encourage that for GA pilots to do not only receive regular training, but before every time you go flying, 
pick up your, your, your AFM and look at the non-normals, the emergencies, and just choose one and put a check mark by it. The next time you fly, look at the next one. And just be familiar with not only what's in there, but be familiar with what it says. And if you just look at one of those every time you go flying, you're doing me a favor, uh, and, and try that. You will learn more about your airplane. You will learn how to handle something. You will know that the, the, the procedure exists should you need it. Um, one emergency I had, I had a cockpit fire on the ground at the gate. As soon as they put external power in and I turned it on, uh, it fused the window heat, which is the highest energy thing running through the cockpit, just started a big old fire and it was short, arcing and sparking. And um, I went for the fire extinguisher. In training, every year I have to pull out a fire extinguisher, then I have to pull the pin, fire it and put out a fire, and I get trained on how to use the fire extinguisher and how to put out a, a fire. What we were not taught, however, is how to get it out of its mount. <laughs> I struggled while there's this fire going on. I remember kneeling down, trying to get this fire extinguisher out. The captain jumped over me to get out of the airplane. I thought, oh, great, he's bailing on me. And here I am, I'm trying to get this fire. Do I, should I just leave too? And we take for granted the little things like that. So try, take it out of its mount. See what that clasp looks like then put it back in, become familiar with it. Um, yeah, we have some emergency equipment. And if you don't have a fire extinguisher in your airplane, shame on you, that's just asking for it. It's so easy. Um, but learn how to get it out of its mouth. I learned that. So things like that. I, I saw a great piece of advice, a, a Pelican case, it's waterproof, it floats, keep some emergency stuff in there right under your seat, uh, somewhere where you can reach it with, with things that you might need. And that's a whole different show. But I learned in Alaska some things that those guys keep, and they, they teach that if you don't have it on your person, it's not emergency equipment, it's just cargo, because you may mm. not be able to get it. You may be stuck in your seat after you land or crash right. land. Yeah. That's, that's really fascinating. So you have had a cabin fire, smoke in the cockpit, um, <laughs> yeah. and, and fumes in the cockpit, uh, and, and I, I don't want to name names or anything, but you had a, 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 one of your friends recently that actually was in an airliner and had to make an emergency landing as well. Is there, is there anything you can say about what happened uh, in, in that, leaving everything else anonymous? Yeah, I mean, in the interest of education, I'm happy to talk about it. He, he was flying uh, out of O'Hare, and you may have seen it on the news. It was about a week or so ago, uh, and hit a, f a flock of ducks. Uh, they found six. <laughs> Yeah, sound familiar? Uh, so he took off and it was bang, I'm bang. I'm not sure if I flock's the right word. Uh, we may need to look that one up. I think it's a gaggle of geese. It's a flock of birds. I'm not sure when it's ducks. I, I are a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it was six. They found six ducks, you know, on the runway afterwards. So there were at least six. And uh some of them didn't look so good, but it, the, his fan blades were all chewed up. The airplane was vibrating badly. He thought it hit his nose gear. And so this is, was a scary situation because he had thought his nose gear was damaged, didn't want to put the gear up. Yet he has an engine that's vibrating, and now he might lose the engine. At the time, it was producing thrust. And it, had he lost that engine with the gear down, well, we know from our multi-engine training, you know, what you're supposed to do, you know, everything forward, everything up, identify, verify, feather. Well, everything up is, includes the gear. Well, if you lose that engine with the gear down, and he was heavy, uh, you know, flying Chicago to Los Angeles. So the airplane was heavy. And that was a conundrum. And you've got to make that decision here and now. And so it's thinking about these things and having these conversations with an instructor or your fellow pilots. Or what would you do if, you know? Uh, so he he left the gear down because he thought it was damaged and was gonna, he did a fly by the tower to have him look at it uh, to see before he came back and landed. I mean, he had out seven hours of fuel on the airplane, so it wasn't a big deal. Uh, but had he lost the engine on top of that, then he was going to put the gear up. And, you know, he, he did a good job with the whole thing. But, you know, that's frightening when, when multiple things happen like that, that you just don't train. So well, it's good to talk about. Yeah. Well, Brian, thank you so much for sharing both this, this story uh, of your time, 9-11, and, and also this amazing perspective on emergencies. I want to make sure that, uh, that we let everybody know, of course, that, that they can see you and get all this, all this additional education. I mentioned, first of all, your engine failure on takeoff again. That's available on socialflight.com. Just go to that, the socialflight.com or the mobile app, 
and click on the FAA credits icon in the menu. That's where all the videos are that get you wings credits, FAA credits icon uh, there. And then you have again on May 1st, and every first Monday of the month at 8 p.m., your four flight workshops. Uh, if you can give us a quick quick plug for that. Yeah, hey, I appreciate that. 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, every first Monday of every month, we're gonna do a four flight workshop. It's gonna be content driven. So the attendees can ask questions. That's what we're gonna answer. It's not gonna be a PowerPoint. It's not gonna be a predetermined lesson. We're gonna, you know, I know we're gonna cover in the beginning basics and how to set up your iPad but it's gonna be driven by the attendees' questions. Uh, and, that, and that's gonna be a fun project that, that's getting a lot of uh, attention. And I think it's gonna be great for people to learn the, the world's most popular app. And speaking of app, I love yours. It's where I go first place when I wanna see what, are there seminars near me? And I look at your <laughs> app, well, it's tailored. The beautiful thing is I don't have to go searching and whatever, it shows me what's near me and what's going on. And I get checked in if I'm near an airport for to win the headset, I better win it this time. <laughs> but you find you. those thank pancake you. breakfasts. There's a lot of food in social flight. I will tell everybody that. <laughs> there is. And so you can see, I found out the other day that a couple of weeks ago that there was a pancake breakfast literally going on. It, it was a, uh, I forget what they called it, pancakes and props or something like that. But it was a fun event. We love being social. You know how to tell if there's a, 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 if, a if somebody in the bar is a pilot or at a party? You don't have to tell. Just wait. They'll tell you. Pilots love talking to each other. We love being social. <laughs> exactly. So, I love your app. I love what you're doing. It makes it easy, and, and it's cool that you're, you're making the wing stuff easy to get to as well. Thank you for that. Well, you are very, very welcome, and thank you so much for taking time to join us this evening and, and help us with all this great education. I hope you'll come back. There are so many topics that I want to talk to you about, and I love it every time you come on the show. Well, I appreciate that. I'm happy to come back and talk about anything you want, almost anything you want. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thanks, and you have a wonderful evening. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Take care. And to all of you, thank you for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. We are back next Tuesday, April 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern time with Lynn Ripplemeyer, the first female 747 pilot. And Lynn has a fascinating story to tell. She has uh, one book that's been out for quite some time, another book that is coming out soon. And it, it's just a, a great story of um, kind of conquering the odds and, and, and just a passionate love of flying. And of course, a story of what it is like to fly such an amazing aircraft, the 747, which is so sad that they've kind of retired that at this point. So very, very timely story. On Tuesday, May 2nd at 8 p.m., the Hurricane Hunters are here from NOAA and talking about flying the P-3 Orion. We will have one of their pilots here learn what it's like to fly into a hurricane in that aircraft to help protect lives on the ground. Until next time, again, thank you so much for joining us here on Social Flight Live. We appreciate all of your support for us and for general aviation. And I wish you all blue skies. Thank you.